It's our 135th episode, and there were 135 shuttle missions, so it seems appropriate to do something to celebrate that. So today, we're talking to Dr. Kevin Fong, who has just announced a brand new podcast he's producing called 16 Sunsets, the extraordinary untold story of the space shuttle. You can't be a bit of cross-podination. Please let us know your thoughts on this episode. You can do this via our social media pages at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on on Instagram and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. And don't forget to consider joining us at Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash Space and Things. But right now, enjoy episode 135 of the Space and Things podcast. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 135 of the Space and Things podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I'm doing great. I had kind of a neat weekend and week thus far, but I'll talk more about that in the things I've noticed this week uh, section. Excellent. I've had a good time this week, so how are you doing, Dave? Not too bad, not too bad. Hey, we had our first iTunes review in a long time. Oh, wow. We f- keep forgetting to mention to people to review us on iTunes. If You've got the time. Just go and leave us a review. It it does help us out, but it's also nice to read read things. We've both got egos. Anyway, uh, yes. big <laughs> thanks to, to Jet Screamer 0769 for your five-star review. Super terrific. Richard Easton tells an absolutely fascinating story about his dad. The arc of this man's contributions to satellite technology from Vanguard to GPS makes me think he is to satellite tech what Kelly Johnson is to aircraft. The review goes on and has lots of nice things to say, but it's great to see our episode with Richard Easton about GPS went down so well. And Vanguard, don't forget, and Vanguard. Anyway, shall we crack on with this week's main feature? Yes, let's crack on. Okay, so some of you may have listened to the BBC's 13 Minutes to the Moon podcast. Series one was about Apollo 11 and came out in 2019 to commemorate the 50th anniversary of that mission. And season two came out a year later and was all about Apollo 13. These podcasts are incredible and Anyone interested in the Apollo program should listen to them. I learned so much from the insight, from the wonderful interviews that they conducted, and it brought me even closer to the missions which I've loved for so many years. Recently, the team behind those podcasts announced that they were going to be starting a brand new podcast called 16 Sunsets, the extraordinary untold story of the space shuttle. And because this is our 135th episode and there were 135 shuttle missions, we figured that this was the perfect thing to talk about this week. So we're joined by the host of these amazing podcasts, Dr. Kevin Fong. So the new series isn't a BBC production. The team have decided they're going to do this independently. And as a result, they have started a Kickstarter campaign to help them raise the money to be able to do this. Full details will be in our show notes, which you can find in your podcast provider or on our website, spaceandthingspodcast.com. We'll also be posting these links on our social media pages. Dr. Kevin Fong is a multi-award winning author, broadcaster, and medic who has written and presented major TV, radio, and podcast series, including 13 Minutes to the Moon, which is from the BBC World Service, Shuttle the Final Mission for BBC Two, and the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures entitled How to Survive in Space. A consultant anaesthetist and professor of public engagement and innovation at University College London, Kevin was seconded to NHS England as National Clinical Advisor in Emergency Preparedness, Resilience and Response for the COVID-19 incident. Kevin has a long-standing interest in human space exploration and space medicine and has worked with NASA's Human Adaption and Countermeasures Office at Johnson Space Center in Houston. When not doing all of that, he can be found flying across southeast England with Air Ambulance Kent Surrey Sussex. He also got down to the final 91 candidates in the latest ESA astronaut selection program and he wrote a great article on that process for The Guardian, which I will post a link to in the show notes as well. Anyway, let's find out about this new podcast and what they have planned. Well, if you haven't changed any, it's really something else. John has been telling me about it for three years, but ain't no way you can describe it. Hello, Dr. Kevin. Thank you very much for joining us this week. 
I'm very excited about 16 Sunset. So I'm very keen to find out more. Before we do, though, if you don't mind, can you give our listeners a little bit of background? Where did the love of spaceflight come from? And what was your motivation to start making spaceflight podcasts? Wow, that's that, that's a long question, but... You know, my, my obsession with space is sort of lifelong. And that I have my parents to thank for. They were clever. I grew up in the 70s. They wanted to find a way to drive my ambitions. And, and they used space and human space exploration as a vehicle for that. They knew enough that we should be talking about this stuff around the dinner table, even though they didn't themselves have a technical background. And that made me chase this thing. And I chased it through my whole life. That's what made me choose to do what I did at university. And it led me to work later, you know, write lots and lots of annoying letters to NASA and then get a job as an intern there. And then later on, I started working with the BBC, uh, making radio programs, not always about space, mostly about science. But I clubbed together with Andrew Luck Baker and Rami Zabar, two incredible science producers at the BBC. We just really hit it off and we, we worked really well together. And I would come to them with these crazy space ideas and one of them became 13 minutes to the moon and i barreled up to them like sort of this excited tigger type person (laughs) and they calmed me down we thrashed it out and we made it into what it became amazing so you've started a kickstarter campaign for 16 sunsets and your 13 minutes to the moon podcast you spent a whole season breaking down one mission so with the shuttle having 135 missions this has to be giving you some headaches in terms (laughs) as what to focus on So can you maybe give us a little sneak peek as what to expect from the new podcast series? Yeah, absolutely. And that's always the problem, isn't it? There's always more story than there is time. And you guys know that as well as anybody else. Absolutely, yeah. And this is partly why we took this on in a new way. You know, this is a different time, different space, if you like. We wanted to tell this story in our way, going it alone, because it's, it's a different scale, isn't it? We spent two seasons concentrating on one mission for season one and one mission for season two. In fact, 13 minutes of one mission for season one and six or seven days worth of mission for season two. But this time, you know, we're looking at the whole shuttle era. So it's different and it's different in tone. And I think this for me is interesting because this is the backdrop to my life. You know, I was a little bit too young to fully understand Apollo, but shuttle was there and shuttle was there at every moment. And indeed, I was lucky enough to go and work for NASA as an intern, when I was my final year in medical school, I went to Johnson Space Center and worked with Medical Operations Group. That's 97. So I was there on and off for more than a decade as this thing happened in the background. So for me, it's a very deeply personal story, uh, not just because of what it meant for me growing up as a child, watching it go off the deck when I was you know, only, what, 10 years old or something, but you know, in adult life, working alongside those people, making that stuff happen. And, and, and I know, I know that there's so much story beyond what people think they already know. Mm, Which leads me nicely onto this. The incredible thing about 13 Minutes is that even Emily and I, who have probably read the majority of the history books about the Apollo program, have learned a lot of new things. Over the last few years, there have been a lot of new space shuttle books come out, and a lot of the story was quite well documented through various films and public outreach programs which took place at the time. Is it difficult to find untold stories of the space shuttle or am I blinded by the fact that I was alive and paying attention to this? I think it's the opposite. I think it's much, much easier to find these untold stories because Apollo had been told and retold and retold, you know, it's it's a bit like Batman movies, you know, it's sort of like (laughs) how many times can you tell this story in a different way? But there's two things. One is when we were first trying to make Apollo, I remember barreling in to the BBC with the proposal and people just not being that interested. They're like, well, who cares that that people have told this story? The Americans are going to tell this story. What can you bring to it that's new? I'm always amazed that professional storytellers don't understand that there is always something you can find if you work hard enough and you have enough insight. And this is doubly true for 16 Sunsets. This is an era that actually we kind of took our eye off the ball. We kind of haven't had that forensic exploration of Space Shuttle the way we really have done, certainly for Apollo 11 and Apollo 13. You know, no one's ever made a feature-length movie about Shuttle. Not one that, you know, is there in the same way that the Tom Hanks movie was for 13 or First Man was for Apollo 11. So I think that there's plenty to do. And, And 16 Sunsets for us was... 
it's a different kind of mission and it's a different mission type, isn't it? And, and, and in the same way that when we thought up the title for 13 minutes, you know, me and Rami and Andrew sat around thinking, how are we going to do this? What are we going to call this? And I remember spending hours and hours with the mission logs going through and trying to work out where the time scale would be for 13 minutes to the moon. 13 minutes is where you've got to do it. That's, that's where all the action happens. In the same way as we were thinking about this series for 16 Sunsets, actually that came out of that thing that you well know, that in low Earth orbit travelling at 17,500 miles an hour, you watch the sun rise and fall 16 times a day. And that's really the iconic picture of those missions, you know, watching the Earth spin by below you, watching the light and dark come at 90-minute cycles. And that's what gave me the excitement, right? That romantic idea of you sort of perched in orbit, looking down on the Earth in one direction and looking out into space in the other, into the infinite mm, void. For sure, yeah. Uh, and so it's called 16 Sunsets. Oh, as I said, we're going it alone. We're, we're running a Kickstarter campaign for it because well, that seems to be what you do if you want to do something on your own these days. And so you can find us there if you get to kickstarter.com and type in 16 Sunsets, you'll find us there. I'd love to get this made, partly because I just love exploration and this is as much a part of exploration as anything else is, so I really want to get it made. So what kinds of people uh, will you be interviewing for this podcast? We were talking about this not long ago, uh, Rami and Andrew and I, and sort of we, you know, we joke about getting the band back together. This is exactly <laughs> the same team that pulled together 13 Minutes to the Moon. It's a team effort. And we joked about sort of all being in the command module together in previous productions but it's really how it feels you know it's, at times it's quite claustrophobic but you know living in and out of each other's pockets metaphorically <laughs> if not literally you're creating this thing on the fly together as a team and so it's always a bit of a murder mystery this whole thing well hopefully there's no murder <laughs> but but you're you're always chasing around after people and trying to thread together this story assemble this story as you go we're going to try and find that same sort of cast of people who were essential to the mission but who are often overlooked by history but it's all about story for us you know and i think the really interesting thing for me about 16 sunsets is that it's so personal to me as it is to lots of people of my sort of age you know it's the backdrop to our lives and it was that sense that the future was here and and actually almost tangible i mean i mean to me it felt almost tangible you know when i was out there at my desk at johnson space center in houston uh with, with life and medical science groups you know i thought this is front row seats and if i step hard enough forwards i'm <laughs> i can get onto that thing and so you know it's the promise of everything that it held that great optimistic promise of a future that looked just infinitely bright from where i was sitting so that's the story i want to tell and you know what it meant to us what it became and then just the inside nitty gritty of just what it takes to get a vehicle like that off the deck yeah over and over again as you said 135 times i kind of hate following up what you just said with this question you know, the space shuttle, obviously, it does have a complicated legacy. You know, it was an incredible program. It did give us glimpses of what the future would look like. But um, it also had design issues that unfortunately resulted in, in crew fatalities. So how does one reconcile this? The fact that this incredible program was, it was flawed in some aspects uh, or some respects on a podcast. So it's really interesting, isn't it? Because that's part of the thing that you want to try and interrogate properly. Because you know that's one of the narratives, isn't it? It has yeah. design flaws and it should never have been built. And I think those things are quite easy to say in retrospect. But it is a product of its time. It's a product of, I guess, the, the practicalities of the time and the budgets that were going around. And then you have to ask yourself, I guess, what happens if it doesn't happen? Mm. Does someone switch to some amazing superior architecture that everyone should have seen. I'm not sure it does. I think if you look at the facts, you end up with a massive hiatus in human space exploration that may indeed become an indefinite hiatus. So, But I don't know. And that's the problem, that there's a bit of science in this, there's a bit of art, but there's a lot of history and, and we don't have the counterfactuals. It has a difficult legacy. But here's the thing about it. When you understand the challenge of putting people into space what it takes to sit people on top of a barely contained vehicle with the explosive capacity of something like a small nuclear weapon, to move them from 0 to 17,500 miles an hour over eight minutes, to, to understand the energy conversions you need for that, 
it is not amazing to me that two crews and two vehicles were lost. It's amazing to me that 135 weren't lost. And I'm not sure that we will reach any time soon a situation in which spaceflight is orders of magnitude safer than that. I know people say we have, but I'll believe that when we've thrown 10,000 new flights of something else and none of them have fallen out the sky. Mm, that's a very, very good point. So, from looking at the 16 Sunset social media pages, um, we'll ignore the post about the Baran for Emily's sake for a moment, but it looks like you're going to dig deep into the value of the space shuttle in terms of how it helped to shape the modern world back on Earth. What do you think is the most important example of a space application which came from the space shuttle? So, I... I always rail against the narrative of spin-offs being a justification for space, you know, human space exploration. I think for me, the main justification for human space exploration is exploration mm. and, and that not knowing what you're going to get. And we've never known what we're going to get from these things. And trying hard for anything makes you better at everything. You know, that's the lesson I hand down to my kids. That's the lesson I hand down to anyone who cares to listen. And this is the hardest thing to try for. Yeah. And so uh, the most important legacy of shuttle is the most important legacy of apollo which is the generation of people that want to follow and emulate and, and go on to do great things even if they don't go into space and the reason that i'm a doctor of medicine today is because i loved science and i loved science because i loved space exploration and that is legacy and and it's hard to beat it's hard to beat that for a sense of inspiration i know people have tried but it's hard to beat now in terms of what do i think is one of its most important practical scientific deliveries well it's hard to beat Hubble Hubble Space Telescope, um, sure. the Hubble servicing mission. You know, 1993, first servicing mission. I am in my final year of astrophysics at that time, and I remember I, I loved cosmology. I mean, I that was my favourite class of the whole course. I loved the idea, this whole musing about the age of the universe and how it came to be and where it was headed, all of that big canvas stuff. But Hubble launched, and it was optically imperfect. And if it hadn't been for shuttle, that's that's all she wrote. That's it. No more. And yet they get up there, they wrestle it into view, and they effectively put a pair of contact lenses on it, and not a pair, just one. And, yeah. and, and, they, and they get it to deliver these photographs. And I just remember seeing those first pen sharp pictures from Hubble that told you you lived in a universe that was much bigger than you even, and you knew it was big, but it was vast, and not just vast, but dense and packed with exotic objects about which we knew nothing. And I often muse about that, about how far we've come in our understanding of the universe in the intervening 30 odd years. You know, I often say to people in 93, when I finished astrophysics, we hadn't seen, I think we'd maybe seen one planet outside of our solar system. We knew they were there, we couldn't see them. We were only really just about beginning to be sure about how old the universe was. We were only just really settling firm on the idea of the Big Bang Theory being the theory. And today we're up there with James Webb Space Telescope peering into the atmospheres of extrasolar planets and working out that there's methane there. It's crazy. So uh, for me, everything the shuttle did to prolong the life of Hubble Space Telescope is its best legacy. But there's so much more besides. All right. We're going to look back a little at 13 Minutes to the Moon. So the most poignant episode for me may have been the Mike Collins one, where you guys profiled Apollo 11's most in-the-background crew member. What was he like, and what are your best memories of him as an interviewer? And who was the most surprising person you interviewed in the making of those two series? So... 13 Minutes to the Moon, which again, we, we made with the BBC, and so, you know, separate from 16 Sunsets, which we're running this Kickstarter campaign for. But Michael Collins will stay with me forever, I think, partly because he was, I think, if not the first, the second interview that we did for the whole programme. Mm. And it's a high-stakes interview. We know, because Andrew Luckbaker had done his research, that he doesn't suffer fools. So if you haven't done your homework and you ask him stupid questions, he'll kick you right out of the room. <laughs> and we didn't want that, having come so far to see him. And I remember rolling up, you know, to his house, nervously in the car and getting out of the and thinking, you know, you don't want to mess any of this up. You've got to be careful. You've got to be respectful. And he, he's he's already waiting for us at the door in these sort of Floridian shorts and, and, and this T-shirt and flip-flops. And, and it's not what you expect. And you're already now off guard. And you think, oh, great, this is not good. And interviewing him was a delight and a terror at the same time. He's 
an incredible person. He's a bit of a renaissance man himself. You know, he's a fighter pilot. He's an engineer. He, of all the Apollo astronauts, I think wrote the best book, Carrying the Fire is the best Apollo book for me. Beautifully written, beautiful prose, very sensitively done. When you interview Mike Collins, you know you're interviewing a fighter pilot. And what I realized very quickly was he's utterly performative. So everything is perfect or it's nothing. And I guess that's what it must be to be like a fast jet pilot, right? Either you pull the maneuver off or you don't. There's no half committal. And so, so you're asking these questions and you'd answer, be very jovial. And, and then you'd ask a follow on and you go, I've given you all I've got. There's nothing more. Wow. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> he composes answers. So you'd ask him a question and he'd sort of rock back in his chair and close his eyes and then he'd deliver it. And, and, and you got the impression that that's how he flew, right? Careful thought, execute manoeuvre, manoeuvre done, move on, next thing. <laughs> yeah. And as an interviewer, as you know, part of your challenge is to sort of get it so that you manoeuvre them into a position where you can ask them the questions you want to ask them. And every time I thought I was doing that, every time I thought I was breaking him down, or at least breaking down his defences a bit, wherever you thought you were behind him, very rapidly found out he was behind you and hosing you down. And, 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 and so Andrew and I were very relieved with that interview to have basically managed to stay in the room for a couple of hours with him without him kicking us out and calling us idiots. But we <laughs> got close on one or two occasions. Well, I did. I did. But yeah, he was wonderful and very generous and a brilliant person to interview. And uh, I kind of miss him dearly, really. He, he, he was a fantastic person. So Michael Collins, all day, my favourite. Well... Certainly my favourite astronaut to interview, yeah, absolutely. Every interview was so unexpected in different ways, and you had to take great care to interview these people. These are people in their, often in their mid to late 80s. There was a bit of craft to just knowing how to get them to be the best they could be in those moments. And I loved interviewing John Aaron, the uh, ecom for and uh, very famously his, the role he played in Apollo 13 but John Aaron as a flight controller who apparently was the flight controller's flight controller everyone wanted to be John that's what all the other flight controllers said we all wanted to be John none of us could be John and he was surprising I guess surprising may not be the right word but he told stories as well as anyone has ever told stories you know and and, and he'd tell them to you like they had just happened to him yesterday and he had a turn of phrase and I, I wish I could do his accent, but, you know, that sting that we used of him that he says, you know, you're coming back from space at 25,000 miles an hour. That is hauling the mail. <laughs> you think <laughs> it's, 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 it's just such a great, great way to express himself. We loved spending time with him just because he was so clear about what the whole experience had been, both emotionally and technically for him. But there were others. I mean, Steve Bales, the evening we spent with Steve Bales, sitting down eating Philly cheesesteaks with him while he reminisced about his time as the guidance officer for Eleven. I think the thing to say is that every single interview we did, there was a bit of gold in there somewhere, and and we just loved them all. Obviously, I know that the COVID pandemic for you, Dr. Kevin, was probably more intense than for a lot of people. But the fact that it happened as season two of 13 Minutes was coming out, meant, and I'm sure you remember this better than anyone, that there was a gap and you filled it with the full John Aaron interview. You gave us all of it, which I don't think was the original intention. And how lucky as listeners we were at that point. I must have listened to that interview about four times on my daily walks. It was really great to be able to do that. And yeah, we remember it well, because uh, by this time I'd, we're trying to finish season two, I think, of 13 Minutes, and I'm firmly seconded to NHS England with, with the COVID response team, so I have no spare time. I am seven days a week, 16 hours a day, and I'm telling Andrew that I just can't record the last few episodes. We'd got almost to the end of it, and I just didn't have any time to, and uh, Andrew, Rami, and I talked about it, and we decided that actually... You know, there were some interviews that were worth running really long, and that was one of them. And so that held the gap for us while while I sort of got back to the thing that I, I, I had to do. But it was more than that, because Apollo 13 and everything that that crew overcame became really resonant to me during COVID. Absolutely. It, the, the, this idea of a crew facing something that is overwhelming at source, that is 
insurmountable at source and yet is nevertheless overcome was so, so directly relevant to me during COVID and to watch the people that I worked with, who, who I became as proud of, if not more proud of, in the way that they conducted themselves, you know, the, the, the frontline teams who are out there in the trenches every day. So in a strange way, and you can hear it in the final episode of Apollo 13, that's the second season uh, of 13 Minutes to the Moon, that all comes to bear in sort of the closing comments of the series and and, and meant a lot to me, I think. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to share an anecdote of something that meant a lot to me from listening to 13 Minutes to the Moon. During the first season, I travelled to the United States for the anniversary, 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing. And I just listened to the interview with Bob Carlton, the episode that had the interview with Bob Carlton where he talked about the stopwatch. And I'm walking around the National Air and Space Museum at Adva Hazy, just outside Washington, D.C. And I'm looking at a cabinet which has got Jim Irwin's moonwalking suit. I think it was Jim Irwin's. And I looked down... And there was the stopwatch. There's the stopwatch. <laughs> right? And I literally had listened to that part of the podcast the day before, perhaps. And I stood there and I just wept. <laughs> because the way you presented that, that story of the stopwatch was so amazing. And there, and there it was, this tiny item, which had no fanfare about it. And it's next to a moon suit, which, you know, there's only four of them on display. And I was more moved by the stopwatch. And I love how your podcast did that to me. It broke down the mission to the smallest items and gave a context which meant that there I was weeping at a stopwatch. Well, but, but, that, so, but that's the whole thing, isn't it? That The seconds absolutely. that ticked away on that stopwatch are the final seconds, the decisive seconds of that mission. So, yeah, well, I'm, I'm you know, mission accomplished for us, I think. Absolutely. And finally, you've got a captive audience here of people who... <laughs> Clearly like space podcasts. So give us one final pitch as to why they should go and check out this Kickstarter for 16 Sunsets. 16 Sunsets is the next big adventure for me. And it is a delight that I've managed to cajole Andrew Luck Baker and uh, Rami Zabar to come back and make it with me. Because I know that that's when I'm at my best with, mm. with them and with us riffing off each other. You know, it really is like being in a rock band. We're not quite rock stars, unfortunately. But, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, uh, that's what makes it great. The 16 Sunset story, I absolutely believe in. I think it is as epic, if not more epic, than the 13 Minutes story. We've gone outside the BBC for it. We wanted to tell it in our own way. I'm passionate about storytelling. You know, storytelling is a thing that I do. I love doing it. I love this story. It's very personal to me, this one. It's very different. It is both formative for me. It's it's what made me choose the career I chose. And it became part of my professional career. And so setting up the Kickstarter campaign to do it is because I, I believe so much in that story. And I really, really, really want to bring people with me. Because I know that people of, of my sort of age, and there's a big bracket of us around there, it was a huge part of our lives, and whether we knew it or not, it was there as this sort of permanent feature for 30 years, mm. 30 years. And so I so want to tell this story. So we've got the Kickstarter up and running. We've got about, I don't know, a couple of weeks left on it and really hoping that people get behind us. I'm going to make the story. I, I want to make the story. It is an important story to tell. And the more I read about it, the more I understand it, the more it becomes important to me to, to share it with everyone else and, and to do many of the things that we did, you know, in the past for 30 Minutes and other series, you know, take what people think they know and e explore it and explode it into something really, truly unexpected. Well, I can't wait. And thank you for spending some time with us to tell us about it. And uh, we'll be sending all our listeners over to the Kickstarter and hopefully you'll, you'll reach the goal. Uh, thank you very much for your time. No, thank you so much. And, um, you know, that just last last appeal, you know, get yourself onto kickstarter.com, search for 16 Sunsets and, and click on that link and back us if you can. Anything you can do will help us. We really want to get this one done. I'm heading right there now.
This is exciting, isn't it? Yes, I, I, I'm really excited. That there's never really been, uh, to my knowledge, except for, uh, you know, like a few shows, uh, a full-length podcast about, you know, the shuttle program. I hope this gets made. I would love to listen to this. And I'm sure I, of course, me, be, me being a little full of myself, I, I'm, oh yeah, I know everything about the shuttle program. I lived through it. Yeah, there's going to be stuff I didn't know about. I'm dead sure that there's going to be stories I've just never heard before. So I'm very excited. I hope this, I really hope this gets made. And and like Kevin said, you know, people, I think of our generation who really grew up with the program for 30 years. I think this will really be resonant with us because I mean, as much as I love Apollo and I've read about it, it is incredible not to take credit from what the Apollo lunar landings were, but um, we weren't alive for it. We've kind of had to learn everything secondhand afterwards where shuttle, we actually witnessed this. So the, it's a yeah. little bit different. I'm just really pleased that the shuttle's getting a bit of time in the sun at the moment. We've already recorded next week's interview and post-interview chat, and that's about a new book about space shuttle astronauts, which is getting a lot of love right now. So we're going to leave a lot of the discussion for that next week well, discussion about the shuttle for next week, but we didn't discuss this aspect of it. When I speak to people who are alive when the Apollo program took place, it's very much theirs. They understand it and appreciate it on a level which I don't think I can because I wasn't born until 10 years later, whereas the shuttle is our thing. We followed it as it happened, and you know, I got the, the stickers of the patches and tried to learn the names of the crew. I would cut out the pictures from the newspaper, etc., etc. When the shuttle program ended, it was really hard. I didn't want that to happen. It was weird that something that had always been part of my life was not going to happen anymore. And I now know that that was the right decision, and I love what's going on now. But at the time, I was angry it was coming to an end. I, I love going to visit the orbiters in their museums and getting close to them. They're such beautiful and iconic machines, which deserve to be held in high regard, in my opinion. And so do the people that were brave enough to fly them. Personally, I'm really happy that they're making this extended podcast series delving into the shuttle. And it's not just about the disasters, but the positives as well. Normally, we only see things that are about the bad things that happen with the shuttle. And I don't think that there is a better team of people to do this. Oh. Anyone, actually, if you've not listened to 13 Minutes to the Moon, then go and do that right now. Yeah, do it now. During the 50th anniversary, I was just addicted to that podcast. Like, the minute it came out, I was like, oh, God, I got I to gotta listen to this episode, like, now. I yeah. got to stop what I'm doing. <laughs> it was incredible. I mean, and, you know, again, being a sort of, yeah, I know everything about space history, I learned stuff on it that I had about Apollo 11 that I had really no idea about. I mean, it really just broke it down totally as to how, like, really incredible that that even happened at that time because it really shouldn't have. So if you haven't listened to it, go ahead. And I'm really looking forward to the shuttle program really getting the same treatment. Treatment. Yeah. Well, it's also nice that they're doing it independently as well. And, yeah. And- a lot of people think the podcasts, you know, there's something we all have for free and, and that kind of stuff. But it's a really interesting thing to produce a podcast, right? We produce a podcast every week. There's no money involved. There's no there's no big company yeah. providing a load of load of money. The, yet we're up against companies like or corporations like the BBC who throw a lot of money at these things, production wise and stuff like this. They get people like Hans Zimmer to do theme tunes. You know, we're using my music in the background. That's how that's how this works, right? So these things are it can be, especially the way that the, these guys are going to do it. They're expensive and time consuming, and, and all those kind of things. So for them to say, "Look, this is this is how much this is going to cost us to make, and we want to do it and to do it independently," I'm really excited about that because I think it gives them a level of freedom that they may not have had under the BBC. I've I know a few people who've worked for the BBC on a variety of things, and they all say similar things. Great work for the BBC. BBC are great. However, there's structures and there's framework, and some of it's a little bit old-fashioned in some of their yeah. processes, and 
there's a lot of red tape. So to get things done and to get things done as you want them is hard. So to say this is how much this is going to cost and try and make that happen is a bold thing because people don't appreciate how much these things cost, I think. And especially to the standard, we know that these guys are capable of. It's really interesting to see this be out in the public. Look how much this costs and help us make it happen. And as we're recording this, they're already a, over a quarter of their way through their their fun uh, their fundraising. They've got a couple of weeks left. They've had big support from people like Chris Hadfield uh, and Dr. Brian Cox. You know, big names are, are tweeting about this. And I think that shows there's an appetite for these people to make this podcast. And I, for one, I'm going to go and back it as well. Yeah, I plan on doing that as well. As much as I love 13 Minutes to the Moon and... I have, uh, honestly, I, I'm American. I have no, I have no knowledge as to what the BBC operates like. But I think if you have sort of an independent anything, you have more flexibility artistically. You know, you don't have probably a a, a main editor like, okay, you can't say that, or somebody trying to redact stuff. Especially when you can hear Kevin's passion in this project through that interview. Yeah. When, you, when you hear him talk about how passionate he is about the shuttle, you don't want someone telling you. Oh, don't don't cover that bit because it might be something that he thinks is really important and it's someone's passion yeah. will sell something it's the it was hearing his passion talking about other things in the previous podcast that made me excited about things i'd not thought about before and i think with shuttle program there are things that happen that look very small you know somebody who doesn't know any better would think well that seems in- insignificant we don't want to cover that but it was sort of a turning point Or it was something that was the fulcrum for something happening next that was kind of a big deal. So uh, I think it'll be neat to see this podcast independently explore those kind of intricacies of the program. Absolutely. And hopefully there'll be a Buran episode. That's what we're all hoping for. Oh, (laughs) God! Anyway, the full interview will be up on our Patreon page for our Patreon subscribers. We hope you enjoyed what you heard today. And check out the Kickstarter, all the links for Dr. Kevin and the Kickstarter and 16 Sunsets will be in our show notes, which you can find on spaceandthingspodcast.com. Welcome home, Columbia. Beautiful, beautiful. You'll have to take it up the hangar, Joe. We're going to dust it off first. So, Emily, what's caught your eye this week in spaceflight? Oh, wow. So I'm going to be a little selfish this week. A couple things happened this week that were really cool. Uh, as many of you know, uh, I, I founded a group called Space Hipsters. I, I don't take credit for a lot of it. We have many moderators who help run the group day to day and who uh, do other amazing things such as put together our book prize and uh, our field trips and stuff like that. But this weekend, I went to see the Kingston Trio at the Orange Blossom Opry about a couple hours north of me. Very cool. I went there with my husband, Steve. For those of you who don't know who the Kingston Trio is, they're a, a pretty famous folk group. They've been around for a, a long time, and, and they have a really sort of a big heritage in folk music. They gave us a shout-out from stage, uh, the Space Hipsters, a shout-out, and played Armstrong by John Stewart, who was a member of the Kingston Trio during the 60s. And he also did, um, if you watch the Apollo 11 movie that came out about four years ago, he did Mother Country. Which was you remember? The, oh, cool! You remember that part of the film that was they're playing yeah, the tape? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the yeah, 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 yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I love that. That part of the movie makes me cry because I'm a huge sissy. So, because uh, I I love how they juxtapose the tape with the hornet coming in. Oh my god! Yeah, it is just like Absolutely. chef's kiss. Chef's kiss. It's amazing. So that was really awesome. Uh, thank you to the Kingston Trio uh, so much. This was a huge thrill for me. I, I felt like a rock star for a few minutes. I'm not a rock star, but I felt like one. That was really awesome. So thank you guys so much. And, and Steve and I had a wonderful time. Another thing that was really cool this week is we have a member in Space Hipsters, Gordon Perman, who. Uh, did wing walking on an airplane oh wow yeah everyone's like when are you gonna do it i'm like uh never probably space mountain is about as heavy as i'm gonna get as far as stuff like that but um he went wing walking and and had our pin he was holding our pin while wing walking which is really cool so uh thank you gordon that was really awesome it almost didn't look real but it was Uh, for a second i was like is this a photoshop or something like this but um 
really awesome. So that's what I noticed this week. Unfortunately, I just promoted my group for a few minutes, but yeah, space hipsters. This weekend is the uh, field trip to New Mexico. Unfortunately, I will not be going to that. My work circumstances are kind of nuts here, so I can't really travel at the moment, uh, which stinks. But I think they're going to have an awesome time, and I'm very excited for everybody who's going to get to go out there and, and see the Trinity site out there. So I think they're going to have an awesome time. So just wanted to give a little shout out to Space Hipsters this week. Uh, I think we're doing a lot of good in the community in that I don't take credit for all of it, but it, you know, I feel like I'm just the dummy who pushed the button most days, but I, I'm very proud of what we've done. Rightly so. Rightly so. So, Dave, what has caught your eye this week? Well, a few things. Number one, online this week, there's been so many posts about Jim Lovell, and it's just lovely. Yes. Absolutely lovely. There seems to be a load of birthdays for astronauts in March, particularly the Apollo era astronauts, but Jim's 95th birthday seems to have got more attention than anyone else. It's been lovely to see so much of him on my news feed this week. Clearly, he's not just my favourite astronaut, so happy birthday, Jim, my absolute life hero. Anyway, there's a story that's been developing over the last couple of weeks with Virgin Orbit. On the 15th of March, they furloughed the majority of their staff for a whole week uh, because their funds were, were basically out. They've since managed to raise $200 million from Matthew Brown, a Texas-based venture capital investor. And that has meant they've been able to have a small team back in place from March the 23rd, but they've still got a lot of staff furloughed. And we spoke shortly after their failure of their launch in January that perhaps there was going to be some financial problems for this company and it might not make it back. And as, as a result, obviously, we've we've spoke about a few times over the last few weeks about how brutal it is to be a startup space company these days. It's just brutal. So it's good to see they've got some investment back, but obviously horrible to see they're struggling because it's a company that has done a lot for the space industry and have opened a lot of doors and a lot of companies now coming in off the back of things that, that they've done. I think what's interesting is that Branson is no longer putting any money into Virgin Orbit. And I don't know if that says anything about the future of the comp company that he founded. They've spent something like a billion dollars on Virgin Orbit over the years. And they've said that He's got no interest in putting any more money into Virgin Orbit. So I still think it's up in the air what will happen with Virgin Orbit. But on the flip side of startups doing well, you also had Relativ Relativity Space this week launch their first rocket, which was made entirely out of 3D printed parts. Uh, the Terran 1 launched on March 23rd, and it actually made it through Max Q. It didn't make it to orbit. It didn't completely make it all the way into orbit but it did make it past the Carwin line yes into space which is really cool for a first launch of a brand new rocket for a new concept as well this 3d printing is really amazing and there's a photo by john kraus that went up yesterday on, on monday that's just one of the most beautiful launch photos i've yes. ever seen and the flame is just exquisite it looks like a it looks like a jewel. It looks like opalescent or something like that. That's the only way I can describe it. It's really exquisite. Yeah. I'll obviously put a link to that photo in the in the in the show notes as well because it's worth seeing if you haven't. I don't know if you saw this as well. Blue Origin finally say and have announced yeah. they know what went wrong with the uncrewed September launch of their new Shepard vehicle, which uh, had a failure. It did make it back, but it it just was a failure of of a flight. Fortunately, it was uncrewed, but I think the crew would have survived had they been in there anyway. But they've said they've figured out what went wrong, which is good news because it's been a while since we've ha heard anything about that. And uh, the, the story that rumbles on, the leaky Soyuz capsule is now back on Earth as well. They've uh, w w Over the last couple of days, the, the leaky Soyuz capsule, which caused some problems up at the International Space Station, uh, has come back. So I know not the whole of the Soyuz spacecraft comes back, only the little capsule, but hopefully we might get some answers about what happened there. Yeah. And finally, I think it's worth saying and reminding people that on Monday, we're going to find out who the crew for Artemis 2 is. Yes, I am so excited. I have a few friends who are going to be at the NASA social for that. And I'm really excited for them. They're going to have an awesome time and 
I'm really excited. I'm like, oh God, who's it gonna be? Who's it gonna be? Who's it gonna be? Oh God, okay, I, I gotta shut up. When they announce, I'm sure there'll be a woman on the crew, I'm probably gonna just pass out. Cause I'm like, oh my God, we got a woman going to the moon. Absolutely. Okay, I'll shut up. No, now. it's great. Oh my God, I'm getting too excited. No, well, well, I think that's it, isn't it? It's, it, you know, we've covered this to death over the last few weeks, so I'm not going to say anything anything else other than it's happening on Monday. So yes. keep your eyes peeled because we're finally going to learn the names of the people that are going to go around the moon. They're not going to orbit it. They're doing a, a figure eight there and back again. But it's the first time any any humans will have gone to the moon since 1972 and hopefully uh, the first non-white male as well. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the first person who is uh, uh, not a white guy. Yeah, just somebody who represents over Someone 50% else. of the rest <laughs> yeah. of the people. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, I was thinking the other day, I'm like, that is so crazy. It's over half of the country, and yet nobody's ever been there to the moon who's represented that. That's nuts. And hopefully now we're going to see it. I'm just, oh, my God, I'm freaking out. Okay, I'll shut up. I don't, I got I to gotta save my freaking out for when they actually announce it. Yep, so big, big day on Monday. Big day. Yep. And uh, I don't know how it all worked out, but apparently it did somehow. <laughs> but there was things, I don't know, nothing was going right. You know, I don't know, from the beginning, nothing fit. We got that stuff, they got the geniuses figuring stuff out to like the nanometer, right? Or whatever, you know, the spot. And it's still not fitting. We're both trying stuff. I don't know what's going on out there, but somehow I think it all worked. Okay, thanks for tuning in this week. We'll be back with more next week, as always. Look, this is the part of the podcast where I plead with you to join us over at Patreon. And <laughs> many of you have done that already. Thank you to Jessica in Australia for joining this week. I appreciate that. Um, we're trying to keep this podcast advertisement free, and that's a big part of how we can achieve that. I'm putting together a few plans to try and give some extra things to those who are already part of it or those of you who joined. Um, so I I'm going to continue to try and do that. Uh, thank you to those who have joined already and, and those who have supported us in other ways as well, either by donating directly via our website or buying some merchandise. Check out what we have for sale on spaceandthingspodcast.com. Of course, if you join our Patreon, you get some of that anyway. Yes, and it's so great for us when anyone makes the commitment to financially support us. We're 135 podcasts in, which is incredible, but we're still planning so many more. So thanks to all those who've been sharing the podcast with your friends as well. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. This has been the Space and Things Podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. <laughs>